This is Professor McEwen, and under this video, what we're going to look at is the foundations of American democracy in self-governance. Students entering the state college system must pass the state literacy exam, as well as AMH 2020. Here we're looking at two principles that students need to know. Students will develop and demonstrate an understanding of the basic principles and practices of American democracy and how they are applied to a Republican form of government. And students will develop and demonstrate a knowledge of the founding documents and how they have shaped the nature and function of our institutions of self-government. So the first thing we're gonna look at is what is our system of government? So what kind of government do we live under? Is it a democracy, which comes from the Greek words demos, meaning people, and kratos, meaning power, the power of the people? This political ideology was born in ancient Athens in 500 BC by Cleisthenes, who was known as the father of democracy. Under a democracy, meaning a pure democracy, the power is in with the people to make laws through the majority, but the minority has no voice. Or is it a republic, a Latin term meaning res publica, meaning the public thing, created in Rome around 509 BC under an unwritten constitution. It was more, generally speaking, custom than a written document. But it does call for a balanced government, which was finally achieved in Rome by 275 BC which set up a checks and balances system combining a monarchy, the councils, the aristocracy, the senate, and the democracy, the assembly. Now under a republic, they have a constitution in which the minority is protected from the majority through laws that allows the interpretation of these laws through elected representatives in the courts. In other words, these laws can be changed. It is the rule of law that is supreme not the people. Under a republic, the people elect the representatives who make laws and an executive to enforce those laws. The power in the government is shared by the checks and balances system for us, the president, the Senate, the House of Representatives for our Congress, and the United States Supreme Court. The rule of law is bounded by a constitution or a charter. For us, it is the US Constitution. Under our constitution, the minority is protected by the majority. So the minority still have a voice. So how did we get here? So what we're gonna first look at is the traditions of English government. Being apart from the rest of the European continent, the British Isles were able to develop in a relative isolation compared to the rest of Europe. Although the British culture and politics were influenced by continental forces, by the time the first British North American colonies were established, most of the feudal remnants of England were on the way. This would lead to the development of significant beliefs concerning the rights of British citizens, including colonists. The English nobility and gentry limited the power of English monarchs through parliament. One of the first instances we see is Magna Carta of 1215, which established the principal rule of law that no one is above the law, including a king, and planted the seed for limited government. Although the document only forced King John to consult nobles before he made arbitrary decisions like passing taxes, hence no taxation without representation, and in the United States Constitution under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, it provided the foundation creating in the 1300s Parliament a bicameral legislature, meaning two houses, was formed. Members included the House of Lords, which were the nobles, and the House of Commons, elected commoners. Only men with property could vote. English common law asserted that everyone was equal before the law. People had certain rights that not even a king could violate. In 1628, the Petition of Right extended the rights of commoners to have a voice in the government. Signed by King Charles I, it further reduced the power of the monarch to share power with parliament. It included the following. He could not imprison subjects without 
writ of a habeas corpus found in Article I, Section 9 of the Constitution, and the 14th Amendment. He would not force loans or levy taxes without the consent of Parliament. No taxation without representation. And in the United States Constitution under Article I, Section 8, Clause 1, he would not house soldiers in private homes without the owner's consent. This is found in the Third Amendment of the Bill of Rights. He would not impose martial law in peacetime. This is found in the U.S. Constitution under Article I, Section 8, Clause 15, where Congress can declare martial law. After the Glorious Revolution, the English Bill of Rights was created in 1689, and it improved on Magna Carta's limitation of the powers of the monarchy. William and Mary recognized in their coronation oath that Parliament as a leading partner in ruling England. In it, it said no suspending of law of Parliament, no levy of taxes without the consent of Parliament, once again, no taxation without representation, and found in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, no interfering with members' freedom of speech in Parliament, found in the First Amendment, no penalty from a citizen who petitions the king for grievances, found in the First Amendment, no standing army to be kept in peacetime, found in the Third Amendment, no excessive bails in courts or cruel and unusual punishment, this is found in the Eighth Amendment, right to trial by jury, if a treason trial, it must produce two eyewitnesses, which is found in the U.S. Constitution, Article 3, Section 3, Clause 1, and also in the Sixth Amendment. So we see what was created in 1698 would find its way into our current Constitution, a measure of self-rule of the Americas. Colonists believed that they were protected under English common law. In New England, the Puritans formed republics with an elected governor. In other parts of the colonies, the governor was appointed by the crown who shared power with the elected assemblies, which could raise taxes. In Virginia, in the Jamestown colony, we see the House of Burgesses, a general assembly that was composed of 22 Burgesses, two from each town, or hundred or population, plantation. The governor and council met in Jamestown Church from August 9th through the 14th, and this would create the first colonial legislature in the New World, the beginning of representative government. The Plymouth colony was by the Pilgrims, who were the most radical sect of Puritans. They believed that the Church of England still retained too many Catholic institutions and they needed to be purified. Eventually, they would cross the Atlantic to escape persecution in 1620. On this voyage, they crafted the Mayflower Compact to govern their lives and their settlement. The Mayflower Combat was a covenant group contract signed by the men of the colony and formed a civil body politic that was supposed to be based on the just and civil laws. In early Plymouth, only male property owning church members were allowed to participate in the government and to vote. Freedoms and tolerations. Freedom of religion. Let's look at that and what we looked at as one of our fundamental rights. How this would come about. In 1649, the Maryland Toleration Act was created, which allowed all Christians, those who acknowledged the divinity of Jesus, to settle in the colony. This would be freedom of religion for all Christians, which was not available in Europe at the time. In 1702, the colony of New Jersey extended religious tolerance to Catholics, Jews, and Lutherans, and Quakers. In Pennsylvania, the Quakers were a radical Protestants who rebelled against all political and religious authority. They were founded in 1647 by George Fox, and they refused to show deference to religious or political leaders, and they insisted on religious freedom for all, and argued for the equality of the sexes, and denied the authority of religious creeds, rituals, and ordained ministers. In addition, their pacifism the refusal to fight seemed odd behaviors, and outspoken beliefs were viewed by others as threatening to the social and religious order. 
The freedom of the press, we'll see, comes about in 1734. There are articles that criticize the governor, which appeared in the New York Weekly Journal, a newspaper printed by John Peter Zinger. The governor had Zinger in prison for libel, printing falsehoods that are intended to damage a person's reputation. When Zinger's case came to trial, the jury found Zinger not guilty. What is not liable is what he was writing about was the truth. It is important for the student to understand the meaning of the social contract. In moral and political philosophy, the social contract is a theory or a model that originated during the Age of Enlightenment and usually concerns the legitimacy of the authority of the state over the individual. Social contract arguments typically are that individuals have consented either explicitly or tactically to surrender some of their freedoms and to submit to the authority of a ruler or to a decision of a majority in exchange for protection of the remaining rights or maintenance of the social order. The relation between natural and legal rights is often a topic of social contract theory. First, Thomas Hobbes. According to Hobbes, the lives of individuals in the state and nature were solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A state in which self-interest and the absence of rights and contracts prevented the social or society. Life was anarchic, without leadership or a concept of sovereignty. Individuals in the state or nature were apolitical and asocial. The state of nature is followed by the social contract. The social contract was seen as an occurrence during which individuals came together and ceded some of their individual rights so others would cede theirs, the result in the establishment of the state. A sovereign entity like the individuals now under its rule used to be which would create laws to regulate social interactions. Human life thus no longer was a war against all. And so what Hodge was advocating is a strong central authority, like a king. John Locke, in his second treatise of government in 1689, argued that individuals would only agree to form a state that would provide in part a neutral judge, acting to protect the lives, liberty, and property of those who lived within it. Life, liberty, and property was changed by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence to we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Locke would further argue that government was in contract with the people over these rights. If they failed, the people had the right to overthrow the government. Jefferson would use this argument in the Declaration of Independence that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever the form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute a new government. Jean Jacques Rousseau, a Swiss who wrote Du Contrat Social, known as the Social Contract, was the first one really to coin the, the term. He argued that the liberty is a birthright and government is from the consent of the people, which is found in the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution under Article 1. The general will is the power of all citizens, collective interests, not to be confused with their individual interests. Not in favor of representative governments, though. He did say laws that govern people help to mold their character. Montesquieu, a French aristocrat during the Age of Enlightenment, wrote on the spirit of laws in which he argued Rome's collapse was due to loss of political liberty, too much power in the hands of the emperor. In other words, the republic was gone. Power needs to be divided equally. The separation of powers, a legislative to make the laws, an executive to carry out the laws, and judicial to interpret the laws. Each branch would check 
to one another's power. This would become the concept of the United States Constitution. Congress, the President, and the Supreme Court. This, of course, is a Republican ideology going all the way back to the Roman Republic. So how did we become a country? So we're going to look at this road to revolution and independence of 1764. We've already learned that through things like Magna Carta, Petition of Right, English Bill of Rights, and the representative governments that were formed by the colonies, that the uh, American colonists saw themselves as Englishmen that were protected under these rights and saw their representatives, those who they elected in a Republican or Democratic Republic in their own colonies. However, when acts were passed by Congress to tax the colonies, this would lead to the famous cry of no taxation without representation and the reaction from the American colonies. This would first occur with the Stamp Act of 1765, which taxed stamp paper for legal documents, publications, and playing cards. America posed it as taxation without representation. It also included a writs of assistance in 1765 to support the Stamp Act, a general search warrant, which is not specific. And this would be addressed finally in the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue upon probable cause. This would lead to the creation of the Stamp Act Congress in 1765 in the response to the Stamp Act. Delegates were sent by nine colonies and was held in New York City and they adapted the Declaration of Rights and Grievances asserting that the Stamp Act and other taxes imposed by the colonists without their consent, given through their colonial legislatures, were unconstitutional. The No Taxation Without Representation stated that Parliament had no right to tax the colonies. More other acts were also passed, like the Townsend Act, the Tea Act, and this led to further, further division between the colonists and the mother country of Great Britain, which they still saw that they were ta being taxed without being fully representative. In 1774, the first Continental Congress in Philadelphia met. 12 out of the 13 colonial representatives did meet. Georgia was the only one that was absent. In response to the coercive acts, which had shut down Boston, Congress endorsed the Sulphic Resolves, which they declared the coercive acts was unconstitutional due to no taxation without representation, and advised the people to arm and call for economic actions against Great Britain. They declared the coercive acts null and void, which was approved by the delegated assembly. They also adapted the Declaration of Rights and Grievances due to the Bill of Rights of 1688, in which they agreed to establish a continental association to put economic pressure on Britain to repeal its objectionable matters, measures. They also agreed that they would see what would happen and meet within a year. But within that year, bullets went flying at Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, and we are now in a state of revolution. Independence. Even though there were elements that were fighting the British Army in the colonies in 1775, by 1776, more and more colonial assemblymen were starting to think, maybe we should start calling for independence. It would take Thomas Paine's common sense, in which he argued that representatives must make the laws, and the people elect their representatives, and the representatives are expected to reflect the will of the people while they are in office to protect their rights of life, liberty, and happiness, a Republican form of ideology and idea. The absurdity of having a continent governed by a flail monarchical system of government like the King of England, and it demonstrated that a balanced government could be achieved without king or noble class. The colonies need to form their own nation and should consider independence. So this is once a Whig ideology, as they called it, but it is an advocate of a Republican form of government. 
when Richard Henry Lee stood up in the Continental Congress and said that we should declare our independence, a committee was created to form a declaration of independence. It begins with the preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson would argue that the contract theory of government and the popular sovereignty that to secure these rights governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of its ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it or to institute new government. See Rousseau, see John Locke. The Declaration had a list of grievances against the actions of King George III that had led to the revolution. In conclusion, it declared that the colonies were free and independent of British rule and were now a league of United States. It ended with, and for the support of this declaration, a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. It was finally adapted on July 4th, 1776.